know. Dr. Corgi really is a modern, modern day, modern age. Oh, cute. It's Thursday. Oh, and today we are. We have a special guest. It's not Dr. Corgi. I don't mind this oh, background music. I mean, we could just keep the camera on Dr. Corgi the entire session. You know, I do. I do believe people have come to see our special guest now. Thursday is normally, uh, you know, we, it's about age, really. So it's really about anything age-related. And um, uh, we have um, never talked about World of Lazarus. And it, the fact that it's the, you know, it's the, the first um, uh, adventure for modern age. And um, <laughs> it is the soundtrack for Miami guys. I'm glad you picked up on that. Owen Casey Stevens is participating as an audience member, but I have as a guest. I'm very excited about it. It is, um, you know, um, you kind of kind of give you a sneak peek. It's uh, Dr. Corgi. Um, Dr. Corgi, how are you today? Have you been a good girl? <laughs> what a no, cutie! No, she's pretty much never a good girl. So my actual real real guest is none other than Crystal Fraser's shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh crystal's here because you okay so crystal you were an author for um for world of lazarus uh no i was the developer for world of lazarus there you go i, I was also an author i wrote part of it okay gotcha so you were the developer for world of lazarus now mm -hmm. give me uh, you know there's some people who know a lot about it and some people who do not can you give us the lowdown yeah uh well I've got the book right here. Uh, World nice. of Lazarus is the very first supplement we made for modern age. And it is based on the Lazarus and... Uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name for the follow-up series. Uh, the comics by Greg Rucka. So it is a dystopian future where capitalist oligarchs have sort of run amok and just destroyed any semblance of civilian government and replaced all oversight with their own corporate board of interests called the Bacow Accords. And as a result, if you're useless to the cap or useful to the capitalist oligarchs, you get to live as a citizen in some sort of corporate enclave where you live a life of relative ease so long as you are slavishly loyal and uh, continue to be useful. And if you are not useful, you're consigned to the rest of the un or the rest of the world, which has no real support or infrastructure to speak of. The only thing you really have is easy access to corporate controlled media, which carries the messages that tell you your your rich overlords are are doing what's best for you. Oh, so, you know, it's so, pretty fantastic and out there. I don't, that's a I don't little, know how easy it is to relate to for a modern audience. No, I don't. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I'm tracking on that, but, um, but yeah, what a fantastic fantasy world. Um, so is set for a modern age and you, um, so yeah. you, are you playing in, go ahead, please. Oh, I was gonna say, like every time somebody asks me to describe the genre, I have something slightly different. So I guess I'm gonna call it like a like capitalist post-apocalyptic spy thriller. Yeah, I got spy vibes from it for sure. <laughs> I definitely did. And you know, the other, you know, I, mean, I suppose it would just be like modern day, my everyday existence if I were a spy, you know. Um, but so, <laughs> talk to me about um, so. Uh, in this um, in this supplement, um, what are you sourcing? Like as a as a GM or as a player? Uh, well, as a I mean, as a GM or as a player, you've got this rich world that the comics develop, uh, and there are we present four distinct options for playing the game for campaign models, where you can either be uh, part of one of the families, which the world is divided between sixteen uber powerful oligarch families who run basically their own nation states 
and you are either you know biological members of those families or like they're direct attaches and the people who protect their personal interests uh you can be serfs which are the citizens who are useful to their corporate overlords and you can either be you know serf soldiers fighting on behalf of your family you can be serfs trying to survive the political intrigue going on because all of these nation states are constantly jostling for control and influence uh, you can play uh, what the setting calls waste, which are humans who have no direct use for, uh, or that the corporations have no direct use <laughs> for, in which case you're basically playing a post-apocalyptic sort of game where you're trying to survive in, in probably an America that has no real infrastructure and no real support and no real law in place, except, you know, don't screw around with the corporations. Interesting. And then the last option is sort of playing the resistance that fights the status quo and looks at, uh, pulls members from all of the other tiers. So family members who you know, have moral objections to what their family is doing, serfs who are dissatisfied with the system and waste who you know, obviously are never going to have a chance to get ahead in this horrible system. I gotcha. Okay, so I'm looking at Greg Rucka, um, and what a career. Um, oh, yeah. Amazing, amazing work. What was it like to work with that? Uh, like, did you work with him directly, or did you work with his team, or how did that, how did that kind of work? A little bit more with his team and his friends, because he's put together a big team to kind of flesh out I've got the first collection of the comics here. Uh, he's got a big team that helped flesh out this this alternate, very predictable future uh, where, you know, he's got science contacts who talk about, you know, where science will be in, you know, 50 to 100 years. He's got uh, an economist who's kind of helped him work out how this, uh, how this weird corporate oligarchy would work. Uh, so I, I mostly work with them. I, I work with Greg a little bit. He is a delightful human being. He sure uh, seems like it, yeah. Great sense yeah. of humor, really insightful. Uh, if you have not read the comic books, I strongly recommend them. They are apropos right now. <laughs> <laughs> but they're yeah. also very good, just sort of intrigue books where you know there's a lot going on there's a lot of moving pieces if you like game of thrones but you wish you know this was more cyberpunk or post-apocalyptic then these books have you covered yeah i'm looking at them right now they are they're pretty amazing so we ended up um they're they're intense there's an intensity uh to yeah. some of yeah some of the imagery and that kind of stuff um do you can you tell us where lazarus the name comes from or what the you know what what does it oh. reference so yeah, the titul titular Lazarus or Lazari are uh, part of those Macau Accords that I talked uh, about, the, the international treaties governing how these corporations work, uh, forbid outright warfare because uh, Earth's gone through a climate apocalypse. It's very barely capable of still supporting life. Uh, war is very expensive. War kills a lot of people and you know none of the families have a lot of serfs to spare. Uh, so rather than settle everything through war, they settle everything, well, one, through spying, but also through duels through selected champions. And these are, you select one person and augment them with the best technology that your particular company can produce. And that is your, your Lazari, your Lazarus, your, your champion to fight on your behalf. I got it. That's cool. Yeah. And so, so the book ostensibly follows uh, Forever Carlisle, who is the Lazarus for the Carlisle family. And her her power, and the reason the book's called Lazarus, is she can come back from the dead no matter how many times you kill her. I gotcha. So and how did she get that power? Is that just sort of a thing? or um... She's genetically engineered. I gotcha. So each, of gotcha. The, each of the corporate families has a specialty that they they master. So the the Carlisle family are masters of genetics, so they produce bioengineered crops and designer viruses, but also, you know, they've engineered this human being that can regenerate from any wound. Uh, other, uh, the Moreau family down in Central America and Mexico are cybernetic engineers, so their Lazarus is a cyborg. Uh, 
Oh gosh. You know, it's been long enough that I've forgotten most of the family names. But yeah, the different, each of the different families has a different technical specialty. So each of their Lazarus, Lazari has a, a unique approach to being superhuman. Cool. Yeah. She, uh, yeah. I mean, there, there are a few of these covers that are just, um, I mean, they're all great with the four of them. Um, you know, we made these available for people, um, as a, um, as a Christmas gift over the holidays. Um, wish that we could do it now, but unfortunately if you weren't, you know, if you didn't open your Christmas presents, you don't get it just like at home. <laughs> right yeah if you don't open your christmas presents by christmas morning they all go away <laughs> that's right they yeah they go away um the comics are amazing vixter's shares uh, uh, the writing and the art are fantastic <laughs> yeah that's great they are they're some of my favorite modern storytelling so uh i consider it up there with saga if i don't know if anybody out there is reading saga right now but it is the same sort of tone of this fantastic setting with very down-to-earth characters and concerns <laughs> funny uh, uh yeah so uh, yeah so stan's saying uh lazari lazaru lazari lazar me <laughs> it's all very inclusive yes that's, <laughs> that's right but uh, yeah the, so the role-playing game goes into everything you need to play in the setting so it's got uh some extra skills to uh over what modern age has to sort of flesh out things like controlling drones or oh uh, uh, cool yeah, uh, it's got a bunch of new backgrounds and professions based on, you know, were you raised, you know, as waste out in, you know, corners of America that are basically 16th, 17th century, aside from having firearms? Or, uh. you know, are you, you know, a genetically engineered, perfect example of your family who's had every luxury? Are you a useful are you a useful corporate drone where are useful enough corporate drone where they've tinkered with your genetics or given you cybernetic implants so that you're, you know, that much more valuable. So it adds a lot of options above and beyond what the modern age core book does to, to sort of fit the setting. Okay. Very cool. And so then as far as the, the setting goes, what are some of the scenarios or some of the things that you could kind of run down when you're, when you're creating something there, um, just thinking uh, creatively and. I mean, yeah, it, it really depends what level you want to play at. Uh, if you're playing a family or a surf style game, you'll probably be engaging with a lot of politics, either with other factions within your family, nation state, or, you know, rival families. Um, you'll be trying to, you know, uncover mysteries and spy on your neighbors. Uh, whereas if you're playing, you know, more of surf soldiers campaign, you can run it like you would any military campaign, but you know, with more advanced technology like gliders or, powered armor, uh, minor cybernetic implants, things like that. And then, uh, so, you know, it's capturing objectives, uh, you know, pushing back enemy forces, undermining, undermining enemy resources. Uh, the comics are in the middle of a big war right now between the Carlisle family and one of their neighbors, that several of their neighbors. Um, but then if you play a waste campaign, it's, a lot of the scenarios you would expect from, like I said, a post-apocalyptic campaign, you might be like uh, trying to bring your community together to build, you know, new infrastructure like a water purification system or gather seeds or, you know, put together an expedition to go explore a ruined city and come back with resources to help everybody. Uh, you might be fighting off raiders or uh, one of the things that can happen to improve your your lot in life is what's called uplift where the corporations hold these big testing seminars conventions oh uh, weird that's awesome where, yeah waste can volunteer for a battery of different tests and if you're an especially good soldier or an especially good you know uh scientist or something like that you can be uplifted from waste status to be a serf so you can have a whole campaign around a couple of members of the waste cast being or, or trying to improve themselves so they can get uplifted and live a relatively comfortable life. 
Wow, that is fascinating. I, I really love it. You know, I, I'm just checking out the um, uh, the listing in the store in our in the Green Ronin uh, online store, and um, yeah, World of Lazarus is 34.95, and I believe we've got the PDF is probably just a little cheaper, but. Um, and so it's got everything that you need just in that book to, to run something, or do you want uh, we, to add anything else to it? With You'll need you know, the modern age core book too. Okay. You need modern and age core. Okay. Extra rules to, to fit the setting. So it's, it's got a lot of cyberpunk style elements, like slightly better technology and uh, cyberpunk appropriate backgrounds and talents. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't cover the core rules. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Also and, saying, in the back of the book, we have rules for making your own Lazari. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Oh, if you okay, well, what are the rules for making your own Lazari? Uh, <clears throat> making one based on the, you know, what you see in the comics uh, gives you a bunch of extra health and stat boosts and gives you extra relationship slots. Uh, just because you're so well connected. And then most of the Lazari powers come from talents, just like you'd pick whenever you level up. So uh, we don't get into what the talents specifically or, or how the talents are applied. If they could be, they could represent genetic engineering, they could represent cybernetic implants, they could represent advanced steroids. They're sort of left description agnostic, but it's things like, you know, uh, you have a rank in the armor talent, so your skin is naturally tough and you can shrug off injuries. Or you have a rank in the awareness talent, which gives you superhuman sight or, you know, a bloodhound sense of smell or things like that. And that could be, you know, having a chemical analyzer implanted in your brain or having your genes spliced with, you know, an actual bloodhound. Uh, you know, it's up to, up to you how you describe your Lazarus. Normally, a family can only have one Lazarus, but you can either, we give a couple of options for including a Lazarus in your campaign where, you know, maybe you've got just one player who is the Lazarus and handles, you know, most of your physical alter altercations because Lazari are especially deadly in combat. And yeah. then a support team who handles, you know, social situations and hacking and technical problems and medical issues because Lazari tend to be high maintenance. Uh, but you can also have uh, uh, rotate who gets to play the Lazarus every uh, every adventure. And then everybody has their own non-Lazarus character to support them. Uh, or you can play a session or play a campaign where you're a band of multiple secret Lazari, even though technically that's forbidden. I mean, when was the last time a major corporation obeyed international law? Right. Yeah. So the so then the idea that Lazari are there are are the sort of agreement between you know all of the corporations to you know that's how we're handling these things. Yep. Basically, instead of having a big war to settle things, uh, when there's a big dispute, you can't resolve with negotiations. You bring your two Lazari together, and they have a duel, and whoever wins, that's that's how arbitration. Is that him. is so cool. I mean, it's a it's a it's a phenomenal concept, and I'm just looking through you. Know, the, our books are so great. I mean, I'm just looking through this book, and it is just the artwork, you know, the layout, the whole thing um, is is really great. That I'm really taken by the inner the 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 um, end pages, looking at the oh. at the maps. Are yeah. just looking, oh my gosh, that is so cool. These are actually most of the. Most of the art and graphics from this book are right, lifted right from the comic books. And it this shows how the world, well, one, how coastlines have changed now that sea levels have risen, but also I was gonna say, yeah. how the world is divvied up between the major families now. Gotcha. And the major families, they're listed with their sigils kind of at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So cool. So All right. So I have a million other questions. <laughs> oh, um, when you're, oh, when you're, go ahead. Oh, you were asking about what you do in this. We also included rules for running organizations. Uh, this was the that first. That was I was just going to ask. Product. Can you run? Yeah. A, yeah, that's so cool. Okay, go on. It was the first age product to use the, or sorry, the first modern age product that used the the organization rules. So you can you can have your own, you know, 
underground criminal empire or your own minor family within this within this world that you're trying to keep afloat. So each each adventure or in between each adventure, you have a turn to figure out you know, what's going on with your organization. Are you being undermined? Are you in some kind of advantage? Uh, is the next adventure going to be something you have to do to to offset some damage your your you know, family territories took or uh, there's more to the scale than just your your human level drama, even though that tends to be the focus of the stories. Yeah, yeah. And so that I'm so you you were saying you could you can create a minor family kind of in that that exists as a an entity, you know, that is what in service to the to the larger corporation family or whatever. Yeah, the major families are the the big power brokers, but all of them have dozens of lesser families sort of under their control. Got you, got you. And then, um, wow, that's so great. And you talked about kind of there being a even looking at the map, the um, uh, the United States is totally redrawn, and you can see where the outer edges are. Like you know, so it looks like are they saying that uh, there's like a gray area? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so there's a gray area that kind of is the, you know, sort of the East Coast. Is that uh, sort of where we're, where we're sending bad people? The gray area? Uh, yeah, right. I mean, if you, this is on page uh, 69. I think I'm obligated to say nice. I think you are, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This, so this is a map of Carlisle lands. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. The Carlisle family owns all of the, the colored portions, and then it's broken up into the different districts and how they, you know, how they're ruled and categorized, so. You yeah, might, and in this uh, world, the um, the map is reversed, so the United States points the other direction, as you can see by, okay, the crystals cameras. And then the, the yeah. gray portions are, are owned by other families. I gotcha. Okay. So it's just, it's not like that's where the wastes are. Um, oh, no. I mean, the wastes are all over the place. Pretty are they? Okay. The only, the only inhabitable, the only places we recognize as like high tech or stable are around major cities where the corporations have interests. So uh, I gotcha, gotcha. Everything else is, you know, buildings are crumbling, towns are falling apart, roads aren't maintained. Just none of the infrastructure you rely on government for is still in place unless, you know, a corporation needs it. So, you know, you might have a mine town that's supported by the corporation and they provide, you know, they maintain the roads so their vehicles can get in and out and they provide water that's at least as good as they need for the mine. <laughs> Gotcha. All right. Well, so talk to me about some of the, you know, this is um, high tech, um, lots of kind of body mod stuff and, and cybernetic kind of stuff. It, how much space is in, involved in this? Is there a lot of space travel or? Uh, no, there's, there's some hints in the comics that there are space stations in orbit. Uh, they rely on satellite imaging, things like that a lot, but uh the implication is a bunch of families have space programs, but not necessarily colonies or anything like that. Gotcha, so gotcha. Very much yeah, everybody is trapped on Earth. So even though the world is dying slowly, we're we're all kind of stuck and fighting over what's left. That is, uh, yeah, you know, and what I what I love about it is that I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for dystopian kind of, you know, uh, I just, I, I love it. I don't know, I don't know why I do so much. I, just, yeah. okay. I do want to say it's a very complex setting. Image Comics sells a collection of source books that are about the comics themselves, but are oh. perfect for running the game and giving you as the GM ideas for what to do. Uh, that is cool. So the source books give a ton of details specifically on the the Carlisle family, who are, again, kind of the main characters in the books, and uh, the Hawk territories. Hawk is weird. He doesn't have a family. It's just him ruling as an immortal despot. And then oh. Vala... Vala uh, I'd have to look at the... You know. <laughs> French, clearly. <laughs> Russian, actually. Ah, 
the, the Russian family, whose name I always forget, except that it starts with a V. Vasilovka? 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 <laughs> yeah. I know how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, those are those are three of the major factions that you see in the comics. So that is, yeah, I'm, I'm checking out here. I'll leave the link in, in chat. So if you're, if folks are watching uh, on demand, uh, it's we interesting can, because uh, you get things like pictures of the currency that each family uses. Oh, uh, cool. Okay. Uh, so that's really great. So it really goes in deep. Yeah. Little, little things like television listings. See, I love that kind of stuff. I love that. Yeah, it really helps the setting feel more alive. We borrowed some of those graphic elements for the book, but the source I was book has a lot more space. I was going to ask, so the source book came first and then... And then... Uh, the source book is a collection of three smaller source books they already published. So yeah. I believe the first two had come out when we published the role-playing game. And then the third one came out and then they collected them. Gotcha. Yes, I'm seeing that now. Um I linked to volume one. Yeah, these are great. Um, I love the art and I love, I mean, just even the, even, uh, at, let's see, like, that was actually a link to, um, yeah. So I'm looking at, all right, good, good. I was, this is the image comics blog and mm -hmm. it's, it's got a, a link to the uh, source book. It's only 16.99. That's not bad. And because people will ask, yes, there are cyberpunk guns in this. <laughs> nice okay where oh wait, that's in the source book or in our book oh in our book nice. i mean they're also in the source book that's where we get the pretty pictures from but gotcha fancy gauze rifles and and a transforming assault rifle a so. train okay what's a gauze rifle uh so a gauze rifle is a rifle that uses electromagnetism to fire a bullet instead of chemical energy Oh. So it uses a series of electromagnets to pull an iron or steel slug down the barrel instead of using a chemical explosion to push it. Nice, nice. And then the other um, was a, a transforming, did you a say? A transforming auto rifle. It's, it's a rifle system where you can plug in and pull out parts on the fly to make it, you know, an assault rifle or a shotgun or a grenade launcher, depending on you know, what situation you're about to go into. And what mood you're in. Sometimes yeah. maybe you just want to, you know, grenade it. <laughs> that is something. Um, yeah. and let me, uh, I'm double checking something here real fast. Um, okay, great. Uh, we have a special guest coming at 5, 4, well, yeah, not 5.45, for, uh, 2.45 for us. Um, I like this, Squire. That's good. <laughs> Give it. Yeah, it's more than meets the eye. It's a grenade launcher in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Extra vehicles, some some extra armor, a bunch of new computer equipment. You know, a lot of equipment to just kind of give you the sense that this is a cyberpunk future, uh, as well as rules for things like scavenged and cobbled together pistols and rifles. Because if you're playing a waste campaign, you're probably not going to have access to the super high tech transforming rifle. Until you can take out a, you know, a corporate security goon and take his. Right, right, right. Okay, so now I'm looking at some of these. Can we talk a little bit about the um, uh, the gangs? Oh, yeah. There's criminal organizations as well, like like always. Yeah, yeah. That's the uh, sixty-two. Sixty-two. Somewhere in here. Oh, yeah, there are, there are specifically a couple of, the, the comics outline a few more, but there are different underground and criminal organizations like uh, the cartel who are yeah. sort of a, an alliance of different criminal syndicates, uh, just like the corporations kind of had to reorganize themselves to rule the world. Uh, under that new pressure, a lot of old crime families like the, the mafia and... Uh, the tongs and uh the russian mob kind of had to reorganize and rethink how they approach being criminals uh, interesting okay so now looking at sort of these notable dangers i love that 
I kind of want a T-shirt that says "Notable Danger." Um, on, you know, so this is on page sixty-three. There is a um, there's some adventure seeds that I think are brilliant, and they're what they're actually sixty-three or thirty-six rather, <laughs> sixty-three, uh, thirty-six. And one of them, I, I had a question about this. So one of them says, uh, uh, "Waste scavengers discover a nuclear device predating Year X." Oh. So, so what, what's the what's the conceit there? What's the sort of the why uh, is that interesting? So, uh, I mean, the idea there is you know when the American government fell or or got incorporated into all of these major corporate entities, uh, a lot of infrastructure was just left by the wayside. So things like nuclear missiles might still just be sitting around in a bunker somewhere. So you can have scavengers or raiders or a gang just stumble across a nuclear device that could be uh, stored. So gotcha. So the significance is that it is sort of an un, un an undetonated. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. But, yeah. It's also a good chance to talk about what year X is because the the source book and the setting both describe the future in terms of X plus like the comics are in X plus 67 right now so 67 years after year x so uh, we don't actually learn what the date is in this future just that in year x is when the macau accords are signed and these 16 families become the ruling power on earth and this is the future 67 years after that gotcha so you have the frame of reference for the con like the time but you don't mm -hmm. you just know it's this much after this like it's yeah, not yeah so, yeah i like so all the dates in the comic books and in the source book all reference year x i gotcha so um when so so you said that there were as far as the families go they're they're all families except for the one immortal mm -hmm. despot yeah okay what's the story there what's what's how did how does this uh, uh one person become immortal and uh well uh hawk industries was a pharmaceutical company uh -huh. so he has basically developed longevity drugs that keep him relatively healthy even though he is a hundred and years old <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh is it David Hawk? I can't remember. I probably should have reread the comics to prepare for this. And I know we have a creepy, creepy photo of him. All of, almost all of his photos are creepy. There we go. Yeah, that's him. That's him. I'll, uh, I, I will uh, look to pull that up as well. I've got... Um, uh, I'm having a little bit of a weird time with my uh, uh, trying to share this stuff. But, um, okay, so go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, it's worth noting that a bunch of the family heads are immortal, or functionally immortal. Uh, the head of the Carlisle family, the, the protagonists are in the book are also, they're basically immortal. Uh, so, just it's such the perfect name, honestly, for a, an oligarch, <laughs> you know, the, the Carlisle family, the Carlisle group. Feels like that really exists. Probably yeah, so you've you basically got neo-feudalism except the king never dies well wonderful what a wonderful future we have tomorrow <laughs> i i uh go ahead sorry oh and oh i was just saying even if you don't read the comics and you don't want to use the book setting specifically the the campaign models and the character backgrounds, the new talents, the Lazarus talents, they're all useful if you want to do, you know, a post-apocalyptic modern age game or a cyberpunk modern age game or a dark techno thriller modern age game where, you know, the heroes might be spies that have, you know, minor implants or yeah. you know, rely on drones or things like that. Yeah, so talk to me a bit more about the drone stuff because there's a lot. There's a lot to be said. Um, you know, is there like so? Basically, it, tell me all about it. Oh uh, well, so there's some basic ideas on how drones work in the core book, uh, but every every new release of the comic also has new rules materials into it or in it where we can go into more details, and so you can find expanded rules on how drones work and how to pilot them. Uh, actually, in one of the issues of the comic that released recently, I 
don't remember the issue number so gotcha now um so there uh you know is it is it appropriate to kind of look at like what happens in the future future <laughs> like you know what way so that's the you said that there was lazarus and then there was sort of a second um uh, the, what, what came next as far as that goes is that um let's see was that i'm looking here online because i don't know oh, um, oh the the follow-up series yeah is that risen i want to say lazarus rising or lazarus risen. risen yeah yeah here it is okay great and then so then that sort of just continues to kind of follow you know yeah, the, the yeah the lazarus series kind of established the world and gave you a bunch of, of background and kind of gave you the explanation for why it is the way it is. And Lazarus Risen is the series where the status quo falls apart. I see. Okay, yeah, I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking at those now. So yeah, really still, this, like, it's just the what you would expect out of this evocative, you know, beautiful mm -hmm. stuff. It's really very... Yeah. Uh, and then we'll, you know, could folks just given the flexibility of modern age and, and the fact that this source book was, you know, built to support that, there's probably a lot that people could get out of those comics as well as sources, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, just setting wise, it's it's a great source for, you know, adventure ideas, setting ideas, uh, NPCs, things like that. Uh, so if you're if you're playing a Lazarus campaign, you almost... I don't say you have to read the comics, but it'll help you so much to understand the world and what's at stake and giving you, you know, interesting and well-developed characters you can throw into your game for your, your players to interact with. Um, and then again, the Lazarus Risen series, each of those issues has something for the role-playing game in the back of it. So like, uh, might be additional NPCs or one of them has a, a micro adventure in the back. Um, but they all kind of relate to what happened in the comic, that issue. I'm, uh, quickly pulling up the first issue. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah. great. Um, Never yeah. Get the haircut. <laughs> <laughs> and you often walk around with a sword like that ready, and it's uh, always bloodied as well. So, I mean, I'm just saying if you, mm -hmm. yeah, I love it. Yeah, swords are kind of big because, again, uh, Lazari were used for, for settling disputes in duels, which usually means no firearms. Uh, so combat with swords and other, you know, fancy noble weapons has, has become more of a thing. Very cool. This is so. Gr I mean, I, I I just want to apologize for not ha for ha not having looked at this sooner. It's just so great, and I'm, you know, there's there's so much going on in the world, and I and I'm so glad that I've got a copy, and that I. But I'm just looking at this as just a. I'm I'm late. I'm late to the story. Um, just generally, I'm looking forward to uh, to immersing myself in it because I just I do love a kind of a post-apocalyptic deal. We've been giving Greg all the credit for this, but Michael Lark is also, you know, yeah. part of on this series. And oh. so much storytelling in this series is just, you know, silent. No dialogue, no captions, just this beautiful, moody art. Yeah, yeah. And you saw a little bit of that when I was kind of flipping through that um that first the first um uh volume of the second part. Uh, that's the Lazarus Risen. Um, yeah. But, uh, okay, well, awesome. Okay, so now, um, what are some things that you, uh, like, you know, I, I don't want to just read through all of the sort of the seed ideas, but, what you know, what are some some other ideas that you might, if a person wanted to kind of get into this, um, how might you, uh, you know, suggest they do that? I, I would honestly say, like, set up a campaign that kind of takes you through the whole of the world if you can. So start with your characters as waste and give them the goal of getting to an uplift ceremony and winning a place as a serf within, within one of the families and then have them find out being a serf kind of sucks because you're, you're livestock for lack of a a more poetic way to put it. Right, um, yeah. You know, your life 
your life exists, you know, so long as you're useful to people, you you have to live under extreme uh, surveillance. Uh, you don't really have any determination or any human rights beyond what's spelled out in an employment contract. Uh, so have them go through that and then have them join up with some kind of resistance organization and have that turn, you know, sideways and weird. I like it. So basically get radicalized, run into trouble, mm -hmm. uh, you know. <laughs> I definitely recommend people get radicalized right now. I Yeah, absolutely. In the game. In the game. In the game. But yeah, um, you know, uh, or yeah. Uh, you know, art, life, imitating something. Um, but uh yeah, that's a that's a solid suggestion, and I think you know something else that I would want to um, that I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick up the uh, the comics. Mm -hmm. That is, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing it right now as we speak. What is wrong <laughs> with me? It's like I think I've never done this before. I um, mean, it's a fairly straightforward source book where you've also got, you know, expanded rules based on what's going on in this setting but you've got say stat blocks that you can pull for different adversaries that are appropriate for modern age you've got different backgrounds new talents that are appropriate and then a bunch of world information for this campaign specifically that you can also just pull for your your modern age game where right you, you can know, use it as a yeah yeah you can use any of these family profiles as powerful companies in your modern age game who don't necessarily help rule the world because right and i just to be clear that. like n nothing that we've got nothing that you know there's nothing about uh the you know comics that you have to have it's all in here like if you just want that post-apocalyptic stuff I i'm saying i want the comics because i'm a huge nerd yeah i would say what you do if you if you're not necessarily trying to adhere strictly to the comics uh run the game and let your players pick lazarus talents without getting all of the starting bonuses that come from being a designated lazarus and then you know let those talents represent you know genetic modifications or things like that and just you know go crazy with a slightly high, higher powered uh, modern age game. Right. Yeah. Stan says, uh, but Crystal told me to get radicalized. And then Logic Horse says, yep, that's what I heard. Radicalized because Crystal said so. My friends, you were already rad. Um, you know who else is rad? Is My it? friend and yours and friend of the friendless. And um, I just, <laughs> I love this guy. It yeah. is... Troy, have you been drinking again? I wish. Uh oh, no. Tiny <laughs> Ian Lemke. <laughs> Look at you. I love it. Ian, I, yes. go for it. Oh, I was just saying, I was uh, just uh, prepping, sacrificing. I mean, in <laughs> prepping for the uh, Cthulhu Awakens live stream tonight. So. That's right. We're doing an actual play. You are the GM. Look at that cloak. You are the, you know, you are just the the very most. Um, and I and I'm here for it. Um, yeah. So it, it is the actual play tonight. We've got uh, these folks are so cool. Um, they're so fun to hang out with. Um, they are just incredibly decent people. Um, and that tonight is at, uh, oh gosh, where are, is it at five or is it at four? It's in an hour, right? Uh, yeah, it's at seven o'clock. Yeah. I'm tonight. showing, I'm yeah. showing the wrong, the wrong thing. So don't do that. Yeah. Do the other thing that I said. Oh, I see why it's not. Um, I see what's happening first. I, I've got too much, um, stuff on here, so it's not letting me upload the latest art that tells you this is our third session. Um, when we last, can you describe a little bit of what happened when you last, last left us? Sure. Well, our first session was a session zero making characters and everything. And I gave everyone free reign to make, uh, characters as long as they were someone who would go to an unusual play of some kind, kind of an underground uh, performance. Um, so they did that. Uh, it ended up tying everyone together a little closer than I'd actually anticipated, but that was kind of cool. Uh, and uh, they went to the play. Um, it was a little bit weird. There were people in masks and and, uh, and just, just some strangeness going on. And they observed uh, the first act of the play. And at the end of the first act, uh, the room fell into darkness when they 
uh, came to uh, when, when the lights came up. Uh, they appeared to be in the same place, but no one else was there. Uh, stepping outside, they realized they were in another world uh, somewhere far, far from Earth. Different smells, different sounds, different sights, the whole thing. And so mm -hmm. now, uh, yeah, tonight we've got to make sense of all of that. Was it the world of Lazarus? <laughs> um... <laughs> I mean, was well, it you know... soul crushing? <laughs> there could be skull crushing. Never mind. <laughs> So, so that okay, that, that worries me because I'm in this actual play. But um, even soul crushing does as well. So, I mean, either one, either w either way we go with that is uh, is bleak. Um, uh, yeah, the play was definitely weird. I love the Jonesy Jonesy coming coming in with the save. Um, yeah, and this is all about the Kickstarter um, that we've got running. Uh, we've got it running for. It is running until the 23rd of this month. And so the thing about it is that you're going to want to get in there and take care of some stuff. Uh, get your get your pledge in if you have not. Um, it is uh, phenomenal new materials coming. And what we really want is to unlock that next. I want So the next one is people are, are going to get um, the enemies and allies um, uh, mm -hmm. modern age you know, a uh, source book that you can use as a, as a kind of bestiary for, um, for your Cthulhu awakens. But I really want the sixties adventure. Like I, I want that sixties content so bad. I can just, I can just see how much fun that would be to kind of play in that era. Yeah. That, that would be exciting. Now, Hey, you, uh, did you both contribute to um, Cthulhu awakens? Uh, I am contributing a little bit now. Malcolm finally broke my resolve. <laughs> That's right. The, the excitement was too much to <laughs> to say no. Um, and Ian, you you you've got something in there now. Yeah, I uh, the, the one of the adventures in the book I wrote, and I'm doing a little bit of something right now too. That's awesome. This is uh, yeah, it's a groovy kind of mythos for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, very cool. I gotta say again, the group is an absolute blast and they are. they are, yeah, they're just, uh, we're rambunctious, um, and really into it. We're very much into it. If you can imagine that, um, Stan. <laughs> yeah. What if, what would happen if we mixed the mythos with the world of Stan? Like, <laughs> uh, be something. I mean, he could introduce mommy long legs. That's right. <laughs> you could introduce mommy long legs. I love mommy. I mean, seriously, I, I love it. I love mommy long legs, long legs. All right. Well, listen, friends, you know, I know that it's a little shorter than our lengthy hour, but um, we have got, I've got to get ready. I've got to put on my character and, you know, put on all of my, my mythos makeup. Um, and now that, are you wearing that for the live stream? I would, and I might for a little bit, but it's very, very hot. <laughs> I was going to say, it looks hot. I mean, it looks definitely heavy, but uh, how yeah. fun. Yeah. So, you know, and I've got a, I've got a Valentino jacket that was given to me by the, um, uh, by the, the socialite, uh, rich, wealthy, soon to be um, yes. Hollywood star, Ava Louvier. And um, that's played by, um, our buddy, whom's name I'm forgetting, um, May, who's Hammer. Right. May Hammer, May Hammer, May May Hammer, May Hammer, hmm. get it, get it. <laughs> All right, well, so yeah, so we've got to get ready. Um, uh, yeah, Stan's like, well, wait a minute. But yeah, Goofy really is your wheelhouse. And uh, yeah, I would like to see a Stan, uh, just a Stan Thulu, just in general. Um, I want to thank everybody for, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, Crystal, thank you for popping in and talking about World of Lazarus. And shame on me for not getting into this sooner. And now you've got me all fired up and excited about it. I mean, shoot. No one to blame but yourself, Troy. That's true. I no. mean, if you need a, if you need thirty hobbies, work at a place that has you know that creates <laughs> hobby uh, things to do. But not, um, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, folks, if you've got any questions about um, World of Lazarus or Modern Age, um, send a note to Let's Play at GreenRonin.com and we will endeavor to answer them and not ignore them for a month or we'll do that and then answer them later. But we'll still, we'll get there, I promise. Um, uh, Crystal, Ian, thank you both so much for coming and hanging out today. I really appreciate it. And Ian, I'm going to see you in just about an hour. I got to go, uh, got to go get my tentacles ready. Right. See you in an hour. Right. Finish <laughs> right. sacrificing. See, that's right. See you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.